Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's New York Public Policy Lunchtime uh, webinar. Uh, on behalf of the Harriman Institute and the Jordan Center at NYU, um, we'd like to welcome you to Belarus, looking forward and looking east to Russia. This is the last of our uh, series in 2020. And uh, today's session is especially timely as we have seen ongoing protests in the region. And we have um, just a really outstanding panel um, of experts um, um, with original findings from the region and perspectives um, about the region. Uh, just a reminder that uh, this joint series is sponsored by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Uh, we're thankful for their support. And, um, and we are also um, in a mode of also looking forward to uh, next year and we'll let you know more about our sessions. Without further ado, let me turn it over to my uh, partner and colleague, Josh Tucker, who will introduce today's panels and talk about today's format. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks very much, Alex. Thanks everybody for joining us here today. Um, we're very excited to have you with us uh, today uh, at this, what we know is a busy time of year for everyone. And as Alex said, I do wanna hype that we have a packed uh, schedule that we're planning for the, for the spring semester going into the summer of New York City Russia public policy events. But today we're thrilled to have with us uh, four distinguished panelists and the format for those of you, I think most of you have been to some of these uh, online by now, but for those of you who are new today, the way we'll do this is we'll go through each of our panelists will be speaking. Um, and after the panelists will speak, we'll have an opportunity for question and answer. Uh, be, due to the webinar format, the people who are in the audience here can't talk and so uh, as part of the seminar. But what you can do, if you look at the bottom of Zoom, you can use the Q&A button here and you can put your questions in the Q&A button. Uh, Alex and I will be looking through those questions and we'll be selecting from the questions and asking the questions. What I would like to say is you should feel free to put questions in the Q&A button throughout the presentation. So if something, something comes up during the middle of a presentation and you have a question about it, put it in there even though we'll get to it at the end, but that way we have a list and, and running questions to go when we get to the end of the panel. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our distinguished panelists and just in the Zoom format, rather than go through and introduce everybody now, I'll introduce each of the speakers in turn when they go to talk. So our, our first speaker today, is Gerard Toll, who is a professor in the School of Public and International Affairs um, at Virginia Tech's campus in Arlington, Virginia. He is a founding figure of critical geopolitics, a research field that examines the interactions of material space with geographical imaginations and technological change in the study of world politics. He is the author of the award-winning books, Near Abroad, Putin, the West, and the Contest for Ukraine in the Caucasus, which was published by Oxford in 2017, and Bosnia Remade, Ethnic Cleansing and its Reversal, published by Oxford in 2011. Gerard? Well, thank you, uh, Josh, uh, Alex, and for the invitation. Um, I, I want to begin by um, sharing my screen here. Um, so um, what I want to talk about are um, the geopolitical orientations within Belarus and whether they're changing and how they're changing. Um, I am not seeing this in binary terms uh, uh, as a sort of drift to the West or uh, a consolidation with Russia. I think uh, we need to kind of keep in mind that we're dealing with a complex uh, a reality here. Um, this particular research project uh, is uh, studying uh, the so-called in-between states, uh, the six states that are part of the um, Eastern partnership of the European Union that are uh, supposedly contested between Russia and the European Union or Euro Atlantic institutions. I think that that's somewhat a prejudiced conception to say them as contested, but nevertheless, uh, this research project involves them and then also uh, Kazakhstan. Um, now, these in between states have been conceptualized as being easily divided into Russia aligned states, Belarus. Armenia, non-aligned states, and NATO aspirant states. What's really very, very interesting about this moment, the end of 2020, is that if you look at Belarus and Armenia, in both cases, the particular status quo um, that has been in existence for the last really 25, uh, 30 years uh, has shattered this year. 
Uh, it's, it's uncanny, but uh, Lukashenko came to power in July of 1994. The Bishkek Accord that stabilized uh, Armenia's uh, victory in the Karabakh War was in May of 1994. And in both cases, that particular spatial order, that uh, set of relationships has shattered quite significantly this year. So I, I want to acknowledge my research collaborators, Dr. John O'Loughlin, Dr. Kristen Backe, uh, who are uh, integral to this particular project and the funding from the National Science Foundation and also from the Research Council of the United uh, Kingdom. Um, so what we were studying is uh, geopolitical orientations, which very briefly is simply the sort of everyday um, geopolitical imaginations, which may be very implicit or not uh, very, very activated of ordinary people. And in particular, uh, Dr. John O'Loughlin developed a, a modified Gutman scale question for this research project, which asked uh, ordinary uh, individuals in these uh, different states uh, whether they wanted good and positive relations with Russia or with NATO, and then they want uh, it gets more intimate, more military cooperation, and the most intimate or the most the closest uh, is whether they were comfortable with military bases uh, in the country. And so at the, the key is to see where do people jump off this particular scale. So let me dive right in and place Belarus within the context of this larger research. And this this is the the uh, the results across uh, the particular states we are, were able to survey in. We weren't able to survey in Azerbaijan, but uh, we were able to survey in Kazakhstan. And what you can see here from this is that um, in terms of uh, military relations with Russia, um, our Belarus is, uh, is sort of in the middle. Uh, when it comes to military cooperation, it drops somewhat. It's not as uh, close relative to uh, Armenia and Kazakhstan. And then when it comes to stationing Russian troops, uh, you have a jump off. So you have more people saying no than saying yes, in contrast to Armenia. And of course, Armenia does in, in actual terms have a, a Russian base. Um, so let's look at Belarus itself. And here what I've put up is a graph of its uh, that particular a Gutman scale question when it comes to military relations with Russia and also with NATO. What's important to, to grasp here is that, uh, again, you can see the switch between uh, the middle military cooperation where there is a significant support for military cooperation with Russia, but when it comes to a military base, it drops off and there is more support for a and not having a Russian military base in Belarus. Uh, and then of course you can see the attitudes towards uh, NATO, which are attitudes that you would expect. Now this survey was conducted uh, uh, with approximately 1200 uh, people in a face-to-face -face format uh, at the beginning of this year. So January and February of this year. And one of the things that uh, comes out from this particular survey is just how significant the differences are in terms of age group. Perhaps of all of the places that we did research, the gap between people who are uh, between 18 and 30 is sort of uh, the Lukashenko generation. The people who have known, who were born or grew up under Lukashenko have known no other uh, leader uh, of Belarus. Uh, that gap between that and the over 60s is really quite sharp and perhaps the sharpest of any place uh, that we have done uh, research. So um, this is where we asked where Belarus uh, is by age group and then where it should be. And this is a, a graph that, sh that the Financial Times uh, picked up on. Uh, what you can see is the 18 to 40 uh, generation um, is more inclined to move Belarus to the West. Now, 
this is an artifact of this particular question and it's a binary question and so that it can be somewhat misleading uh, but nevertheless i think it's important to underscore and this is something that will come out i think in the other presentations just how different the generations are uh, within uh, belarus here i i've dropped the age group down to 30 so it's really lukashenko's baby so to speak that particular generation and you can see how they're getting their uh, source of information from the internet, not from TV. When it comes to movies, which movies do they like best? This is a sort of generational difference uh, where they're plugged in and a much more wired uh, generation uh, than um, those that are over 60. Um, and then this translates into uh, attitudes towards the Soviet Union and of course Lukashenko's sole project in part is a sort of to have uh, Belarus be a neo-Soviet type state. Um, well, here you can see uh, significant differences between the uh, generations when it comes to attitudes towards the Soviet Union. So those age 18 to 30 think it was the right step that the Soviet Union ended. Uh, those over 60 having extremely di a very different attitude. Um, in terms of right direction, wrong direction, and this, this question, uh, January, February, before COVID uh, and before the electoral uh, crisis and before the beatings and all of the uh, you know, human rights outrages that we've seen in the later part of the year, uh, what you can see is very, very clearly younger generation, the country is going in the wrong direction uh, overwhelmingly. And then look at the over 60s. Over 50% of the over 60s see the country as going in the right direction. And this is a, a particular uh, graph then that got uh, a lot of attention. Um, and that is that the younger generation seem as if they're looking towards Western democracy. I think this can be overinterpreted. I think the term Western democracy is really an empty signifier here. It means not what we have. Uh, um, currently. So they're rejecting the Soviet system, the current system. Interestingly, they're also rejecting the Russian system, and we could perhaps uh, discuss the reasons for that um, later. Um, so what I want to make is, the, uh, in terms of an argument answering that question, are geopolitical orientations changing? I would say Belarus's geopolitical orientation is more in between than it is explicitly pro-Russian. There is a demographic attitude divide within Belarus that is sometimes implicitly a West versus Soviet divide, but that binary can be an artifact of the questions you ask. Um, but I want to argue that the, the, the divide was not an activated clash of geopolitical orientations. But then the, the, re, the really key question is what happens after the crisis, the governance crisis of COVID, the shock of the electoral crisis, and then the violence and the explicit support of the regime by, um, by uh, Putin and by, uh, by Russia. Is that going to change attitudes? Very briefly, uh, there's a lot of that one can say in terms of Lukashenko's geopolitical balancing and then his abrupt change towards uh, in, tilting towards the West and then abrupt change towards conspiracy theories about NATO and Russia affirming those conspiracy theories. So you have the dynamic of the geopoliticization of the situation by the regime and Russia buying into that, seeing that the problem is Western interference uh, overseas, whereas the opposition was very clearly not uh, a, an opposition which was uh, interested in, geo in changing the geopolitical orientation. There were no NATO flags, uh, which is quite a contrast to, to uh, Ukraine. So, however, there is now an unavoidable geopoliticization of the situation. Um, what I want to, to to kind of point out here is that I'm skeptical that there is a change, a, a significant change in geopolitical orientations. Um, trust in Putin is still really quite strong, but as you can see amongst the younger generation, it's a lot less than it is in the older generation. Uh, the best policy options regarding Russia, this is an uh, attitude towards the union state. Um, there is a significant 
a support for maintaining things the way they are right now. Uh, not much support for integrating with Russia, uh, support amongst the older generation. So there is a significant policy divide here. Uh, and there is some evidence that, uh, that there may be geopolitical shift as a consequence of the events that we're going to discuss now. Uh, the research of um, Andre Vardamatsky uh, points to uh, some change. Um, so I think what we're dealing here with are long-term processes, which have to do with demographic transition and nationalizing processes. Those are changing geopolitical attitudes. The really key issue is the critic, those two critical junctures change geopolitical attitudes. The violent intervention uh, uh, the, or the violent events uh, uh, surrounding the uh, elections, violent interventions generally, uh, do they significantly change? And that's where I will stop uh, here and sort of pose that question uh, to everyone as we kind of move forward. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jared. Um, our next speaker is going to be Olga Onik, who is a senior lecturer in politics at the University of Manchester. She's also an associate of Nuffield College, Oxford, and of the Harvard Ukrainian Re Research Institute, and was a research fellow at the Davis Center at Harvard in 2017. Her book, Mapping Mass Mobilizations, explores the process leading up to mass protest engagement in Ukraine in 2004 and Argentina in 2001. Olga is also a PI for the Mobilize Project, which employs a multi-method and multi-site research design covering Ukraine, Poland, Morocco, Argentina, and Belarus to answer the question, when there is disconnect, discontent, why do some people protest while others cross borders? So we can think of little more than the mobile, that's more relevant for the current moment than the Mobilize Project. And we're really grateful to have Olga here joining us today. So, Ola, uh, you're still muted. Thank you, Josh. And thank you uh, to all of our audience members for being here today. It's certainly uh, a very competitive field, as I know. Um, and uh, to all, I'm in great company with this panel. It's such amazing data. I think everyone has very interesting things to say. So. What I'm going to present is, uh, these are findings from our ongoing, uh, we call it a protest survey. That's maybe not exactly fully what it is, but that's how we are, we are at least presenting it. Um, a survey that we started on August 18th, um, and that is currently still ongoing. It is an online survey. It is social media generated. We use a variety of different methodological techniques to target our sample. I can go into more detail about that if, if you so wish. Um, but because we know that online, specifically social media samples, have an underrepresentation of men and youth, we also have special oversampling uh, techniques to target men and youth to make our sample slightly more representative. And so far, the total of our respondents is 41,000 and counting. Uh, but in terms of who answers the survey fully, now please note that this is about 60 questions, which is way too long for an online survey, but we're trying to get as many answers as possible. Out of those people who fully complete the entire survey, so give you a little bit of a who these people are, that's 12,000. Um, 12,900 in Russian and about 835 in Belarusian. Today, I'm only going to be presenting data from, 12, from the 12,900 that completed the survey in Russian fully. Although I did run a variety of tests to see how different these answers were about the protests. And there's not, great, there's not a great deal of variation in terms of these answers if we take the whole 41, because the questions about protests are at the beginning of our survey. Therefore, the broad majority of people do in fact answer them in full. Um, but I wanted to share with you some other questions and therefore I decided to uh, compare those people who completed the survey in full. In our survey, about 19% of people say that they did not participate in any protests, where you, as you see, 70% uh, plus almost 80% almost say that they participated in some kind of protest. Only 31 or 32 rather say they participated in person only. About 10% say they only participated in online protests. Now you might decide whether that counts as protest engagement or not, right? There's a division in our, in our discipline as to who, who counts under this uh, title or not. And then there's about 38 that participated both online and uh, offline. Who are these protesters? Now only looking at the sample of people who said that they have participated in the protests. 
surprisingly, even though we aren't trying to do to massively oversample youth, we still get that the mean and median age of the protest participants is 39. And that's not actually reflected in the people necessarily who take our survey. The mean age and the median age of our survey respondents generally is a little bit younger. Uh, also, we see that about just under 55% are women, whereas 45% are men. Now, of course, this is not a representative uh, story of who's actually on the streets at any given point in time, but I think this is very much reflective of what we already think. What is interesting is that uh, about 45% are considered Russian, their mother tongue, only 35% consider Belarusian, their mother tongue. Uh, eight, eight, percent use Russian uh, at work. Eighty-two percent use Russian uh, in their private life, and uh, at, when when considering uh, their ethnicity as a forced choice, about seventy-six percent say they're Belarusian. This is actually a little bit different, obviously, than the Ukrainian makeup, but not that much different in that we do see some cross cleavage coalition happening amongst the protesters. Um, but when it comes to the socioeconomic status or class that people belong to, here very clearly we see a middle class component among protesters. And they are slightly more middle class than our general respondents, those who did not participate in protests, yes? So most people, over 50% of people can have, an, have enough money to buy expensive things such as a refrigerator, television, etc. Now we know that that is not representative of the general population of Belarus. Um, in terms of the protest participants, uh, they are uh, th they are mostly residents of Minsk. This being said, I'd like to give a shout out here to uh, Emma Mateo, who is collecting a PhD student at Oxford, who's collecting some amazing protest event data. And she found that even in the first week of the protest events, over 80 different city sites had protest events across the entire country. That's something unheard of in protest scholarship. And that is really impressive. She's collecting data using Telegram, which possibly facilitates her ability to do this. Um, in terms of past political behavior and protest experience. Now this I found very interesting. To put into perspective, in Ukraine, when we ask this question of protest participants, only about 36% have not participated in past protest events. In Belarus, unsurprisingly, a place that we have not seen this mass mobilization previously, over 70% of current protesters did not participate in any other protest events in the past. Um, about 6% of the protest participants admit to having voted for Lukashenko in the last elections, and about 11% altogether tell us they did not vote for Tsikhanovka. So again, that's a, possibly a slightly different story than we were thinking. Um, and in terms of a cross cleavage coalition, we have data now over several months. And we know that the, the protesters became more diverse, specifically in terms of socioeconomic class after August 15th. But, and specifically participation in strikes, uh, um, there's a typo there, I apologize, but participation in strikes fell from 21% in the first two weeks of the protests to 8% currently. So people are generally not participating in strike events and various labor organized events. Now, this is what I think is really interesting. We have reported it in various ways. When we ask people the first time you joined the protest event, did you come uh, who did you come with? Uh, and people can answer as many that apply. Now, when people answer multiple answers, 63% say they joined the protests alone. Of course, some of them also said that they met friends or family or neighbors on the protest site the first time they went to protest. That is a massive number. When we compare this to places like Ukraine, only about 20% join the protests alone, even if they're going to meet someone on the square. So we're seeing that a lot of people are leaving their homes on their own to join a protest event when the first time they joined in. And about 22%, which is massive, I cannot underscore, join the protest events alone continuously. That means they aren't embedded in various social network ties where we would assume would be the driving force for mobilization. 
Uh, what do they want? They want Lukashenko to leave, overwhelmingly so. Again, if you compare it to other contexts, like in the case of the 2014-13 protests in Ukraine, this is a, a larger proportion of protesters are focused on Lukashenko leaving than they were in Ukraine on focusing, uh, focusing on uh, Yanukovych leading, right? So it's, it's a very, very clear aim amongst the broad plurality of protesters. Now, because my project, um, and you can check us out at www.mobilizeproject.com, because we're interested in the dynamics between exit and voice, the fight or flight when things break down, we're wondering, is there a fight or flight trade-off currently in, in, uh, in Belarus? Those who aren't protesting, are they just about to leave the country or wanting to leave the country? Or, um, and is it, so in, that, in this case, is it like the Venezuela case that the, the pressure release valve of migration, the migrants are not opponents of the regime, right? Uh, or are they opponents of the regime? So if we look at the, uh, the general population, including those who are not protest participants and including those who uh, are not opponents of uh, the Lukashenko regime, the, 36% tell us currently in our, in our survey, uh, with all the caveats about our survey, 36% tell us they want to leave. We ran similar uh, surveys in Ukraine in 2014, and we only found about five to 6% wanting to leave Ukraine at the time. By 2019, several years of war, we had 20% of Ukrainians wanting to leave Ukraine. This number in Belarus is telling us that many people want to leave the country, far greater numbers potentially than even after several years of war in Ukraine. Now, if we compare protesters versus non-protesters who want to migrate, non-protesters do want to migrate at a slightly higher rate, yes, and that would be statistically significant should I run uh, various tests here, but still we're saying that it's not a clear trade-off active protesters are equally thinking of leaving the country at a very high rate and a much higher rate than we see in other places among protesters. Now to just go back to some of Gerard's points about the geopolitical factor, um, we ask a variety of questions in, uh, of, of our whole sample here. Um, uh, do they want to join, do they, do they want Belarus to join the EU? Do they want Belarus to join uh, Russia? And do they see Russia as a threat? Now, the first solid call um, bar is the non-protesters, then the dotted uh, bar is the protesters. So protesters want to join the EU at much higher rates than non-protesters. Also, protesters want to join Russia at much lower rates than non-protesters. Also, protesters see Russia as a threat to Belarus at much higher rates than non-protesters. So there is some indication that when we compare protesters and non-protesters, there is a geopolitical differentiation among them. And finally, I wanted to end off on the gender factor. And these are also some questions we borrowed from Gerard and his team, um, because a lot has been said about the feminist component of these protests, about women's central role in these, uh, in these protests, and potentially the, the, the social implications of this, that these people are in fact more liberal. Now, if you'd note, I just showed you that they are quite different from the general population, the protesters, when it comes to geopolitical policy preferences but we don't necessarily see that they are more liberal than the general population. And this actually surprised me a great deal. In a family, uh, the husband should make the, all the important decisions. Protesters agree at a higher rate than non-protesters that men are the main deciders in a family. They are statistically at a statistically significant level less liberal on this question. When we ask marriage should only be between a man and a woman, again, protesters agree at a rate of 83%. Whereas, uh, there's uh, apologies again, um, but whereas uh, non-protesters, only 56% of non-protesters. And, the, and then we see something here again, uh, when we're looking at the role of women. Now, this is fascinating. We asked, thanks to the en masse participation of women in the protests, and the protests in Belarus have remained peaceful. 
protesters only agree at a rate of 38% with this statement, whereas the non-protesters believe that women's role in the protest is central to the protest remaining peaceful at 74%. Now, with all the caveats of this survey aside, I think we're seeing some really interesting trends and potentially uh, we need to combat some myths that are out there in the popular discourse. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ola. Our next speaker is Alexander Harasimenko, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Computational Propaganda Project at the University of Oxford. His work investigates how political groups and governments use social media to manipulate public opinion. He also studies how people organize protest movements in authoritarian countries. His research interests also include computational methods, messaging platforms, and appropriately enough now, anti-vaccination movements. So Alexander, turn it over to you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting. Um, yeah, indeed, I've been studying um, protests in, 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 in post-Soviet area for quite a long time, specifically in Belarus since 2012. And one of the most interesting questions about uh, protest mobilization is, and one of the very most common concepts people hear and say when when they discuss recent protests in authoritarian countries like Belarus, uh, uh, when they discuss this pro-democracy mobilizations is that protests, uh, many people suggest protests are leaderless and structureless. There are no leaders, there are no structures. I argue that it's not exactly correct uh, for the case of Belarus and many other cases as well. And uh, perhaps uh, in next uh, few minutes, um, I, will, I will try to discuss who are those people who lead um, uh, protesters that uh, Olga described uh, so brilliantly and uh, who are those people who come on the streets as you see on that picture in August when uh, largest part of the of the protest mobilization happened when uh, when protests looked really uh, of huge scale indeed so nowadays the process looks a bit different it looks more like uh, perhaps uh, uh, like death <laughs> Protests became much less uh, mass if you look at the pictures from the streets, it, but still people are on the streets, but they, but, but they protest a bit differently. They organize themselves a bit uh, differently collectively. So what happens in, in, indeed is uh, perhaps two different types of um, structures within the protest emerge. Uh, and, uh, but what, what unites both types of structures and specifically is key for protest mobilization is that uh, it happens through, uh, as, as many of other similar protest mobilizations been happening recently, uh, it happens with the use of digital technologies. And uh, what happens is very often is um, that uh, the, the, key, the key element of this mobilization with technologies called Telegram, which is one of the uh, most popular places for discussion of politics in post-Soviet states. Telegram reminds WhatsApp, but also has affordances of YouTube and, and Twitter in a way. For, in terms of YouTube, it uh, provides uh, this kind of one-to-many broadcasting capabilities. And in terms of Twitter, it, it's very much sort of text-based rather than video-based like uh, Instagram or YouTube. And what happens uh, with, with the use of uh, Telegram for protest mobilization is that it's often used to spread uh, tactical information about very specific locations, like on that picture, who is Russian. It just presents information on when exactly next location for next uh, locality to mobilize uh, gonna be. It's actually a picture from Sunday, so last Sunday from a very popular channel called Nechta that uh, spreads uh, this type of uh, information about mobilization. But that's how Telegram looked uh, in August. So it's just few, few, first few days of mass mobilization. People have been ch chatting and writing uh, huge numbers. Uh, um, and in fact, uh, huge, uh, like hundreds and hundreds of channels emerged and groups emerged of people who have been organized around the cause of protest. And the cause of protest was of course anti-authoritarian mobilization, uh, anti-regime protest, pro-democracy in great respect. So we, we studied this um, uh, use of uh, technologies through uh, various uh, content analysis techniques and a bit of interviews as well, trying to understand 
uh, how um, uh, what, what was the organizing element in the youth technologies, how they help to organize people and how and what does it uh, reveal about leadership of the protest? And the first thing uh, uh, use of um, technologies reveal about uh, um, leadership is that um, we would highlight three types of leadership in the Belarusian protest, which is also very common for some other types of uh, anti-authoritarian mobilizations. So the first type you see to the left is someone we call symbolic or public leaders. They're very prominent personalities. Many of you might recognize them if you follow events in Belarus. One of them is Svetlana Tikhanovska, who was essentially the key uh, presidential candidate during the election that led to the mobilization, as well as to, to the right. Uh, she meets uh, someone called Pavel Latushka, who used to be Minister of Culture, Ambassador to France of, for Belarus, as well as uh, occupying other positions in the government. Uh, in the first days of protest, he defeated the government uh, and uh, fled the country, in fact, and, and establishing now some sort of uh, proto-government, trying to establish some uh, unite uh, former, former civil servants around him in Warsaw and Vilnius as well. Uh, and there are many other people like uh, this symbolic leaders. Why are they symbolic? Or some people, literature on social movement, especially mm, uh, the written in 90s and 80s would call them charismatic leaders, especially Tsikhanovska. Those people inspire in protest. Another example of inspirational leader uh, is uh, uh, called Kolesnikova. She used, she used to be one of the uh, heads of the um, one of the candidates' uh, headquarters uh, offices b during the election period before election, but then uh, she was also arrested. But she was uh, she appeared to be one of the most inspirational leaders in the protest, also one of the most public. She refused to leave the country in Kotsar to Hanovska. So all of them are prominent, uh, visible, but they're not really much influential in terms of the mobilization I demonstrated on the ground. They're not really those people who define how process is going to happen next day, most often. They don't really tell people what to do and how to um, organize them collectively. They sometimes call for strikes, call for other collective action, but I would say other people have more influence in that respect. And those people are coordinators. Uh, also, literature calls them sometimes connective leaders. They're people who uh, most prominently administer or um, control technological infrastructure that is used by the movement to organize, mobilize, spread information. Uh, an example most prominent is depicted here. He's, he's the leader and the head or editor-in-chief, he calls himself of uh, the, the most prominent telegram channel that I mentioned before, Nechta, Celetech Nobody or Somebody. Um, so um, a young man who, who also fled the country for Poland several years ago now uh, is one of the most prominent leaders of the protest and he's public in contrast to many other people. In fact, most of the key influential coordinators of the protest are not public. We don't know their names. We don't know where, where they are. We, we can guess they're most in Belarus. Uh, in fact, even their friends might not know what prominent role they might be playing in the movement. They're those local people who help to unite um, people uh, around local causes in, in very uh, small numbers very often. And very often they, um, uh, they don't reveal their names, they don't reveal where they live and so on. They've been anonymized. In fact, um, uh, Telegram, uh, the software that mostly used by the protesters to organize, uh, helps them to anonymize themselves. It changed its uh, affordances a bit, uh, its, its settings. Uh, once protest in Belarus started, uh, making the role they play uh, even uh, less, even more obscure, even less visible. So very similar to those protesters depicted on the right, a very common picture now. You may see if, if you look at the pictures from Belarus these days, uh, people hide their faces, so people try to anonymize and remain invisible. So how it works with those local anonymous leaders? Very often they establish um, a chat or a group, it's called, uh, that um, unite just a few dozens of people who live, might be in, in the same residential building. So Belarus, as many post-Soviet states mostly, uh, provides accommodation in, in the form of uh, this kind of lo big residential buildings with many, many flats, hundreds of flats, yeah, sometimes. So people just unite based on their locality, very, 
they live in the same house or a couple of houses around them. They establish a group and to join them, to the group to join, sometimes people need to send uh, a picture, for instance, from their window showing the neighborhood, not themselves, but neighborhood. And that might prove where they live, that they live in this neighborhood. So they might be joined. Uh, and for instance, uh, this is just a, a small, a small, a small neighborhood uh, has has a couple of charts. One of them is depicted here. Then, if you zoom out from that uh, map of uh, of of this district, it's a district in Minsk near um, former airport, you will see more charts actually exist. Not just one, but several of them. They have several size, a similar size, and in fact, then. Not of them are depicted on that map. Many of them are private and you can't really join them that easily. There are no links to join. Sometimes you don't even, even know if your neighbors are part of it. So they try to hide it because if people get joined and if then get, they get arrested, very often they get tortured until they reveal their passwords and login information. And then police logs in a group and it, the group might be hijacked and uh, protesters uh, who are part of the group might be, their identities might be revealed or they might be tricked into revealing their identity. And that's what this organizing happens nowadays. So it's, we don't see, we don't observe those mass mobilizations happening in August or September in Belarus where thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people went on streets, but we see protests in neighborhoods, localized in very small neighborhoods like that and uh, their coordination happens uh, in that small groups that are not easy to join and also not easy to lead, apparently. So once people join, they decide how they want to mobilize for next Sunday, for instance, whether they want to follow advice from big channels like Nechta, or they want to be more creative, for instance, do some cultural event or do some other type of event. If you zoom out a bit, you see more channels like that emerge on the map of Minsk. You zoom out of means, can see more channels exist around, around the country. And finally, you see, in fact, it might be that we have more than thousands of groups and channels that exist uh, um, uh, across Belarus that are very much alive, where people write every day many, many messages. And the chief purpose is mobilizing for the process. So you see the structure of the movement is quite... Um, it's quite horizontal, but also it's 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 not it's it network it's network, but it's not really a network. Uh, I, I call it polycentric polycentric network, which means it's it's a structured network of many cells and key property of this cell. If we cut off one cell or a neighborhood of cells, other cells can still keep functioning, keep uh, organizing people, keep mobilizing them. And just to conclude, uh, so as I, as I mentioned, um, many often uh, people assume that uh, current, uh, current digitally enabled uh, protests, uh, mobilization in authoritarian countries are leaderless and structureless. I don't think so. More often, they have very particular structure that must sometimes might be hidden from us for the reasons of actually protecting, protecting protesters, protecting leaders who otherwise might be repressed, persecuted, and get into jail. Uh, and finally, just a few words about the leader. So I mentioned there are multiple, there are diverse in terms of public representation and other inter interesting property of them, they're collective and they're emergent, which means uh, uh, if, if one leader disappears, cannot fulfill their uh, functions, other leaders can go on and, uh, and, and, and continue leading and mobilizing people. And they're emergent, which means no one appoints them really. Most of the people who really, who really participate in uh, crucial activities or practices of informing people and mobilizing, though they are known, uh, they are not appointed by anyone. They just decided to be leaders um, and they are doing those functions until they can. Yeah, with that, uh, I conclude. Thank you a lot for attention. Thank you so much for an, another incredibly fascinating presentation. Um, our final presentation today is Katerina Shmatsina, who is a Belarusian uh, political analyst focusing on Belarusian foreign policy, regional security, and the impact of great power relations on smaller actors. Katerina's uh, portfolio includes non a non-residential fellowship at the German Marshall Fund and the Think Visegrad Fellowship. Previously, she worked for the American Bar Association, where she managed the democratic governance and rule of law projects. Uh, Katarina, we're very uh, turning it over to you. Um, greetings and happy to join this conversation. 
I will touch uh, broadly on uh, Belarusian foreign policy, and I think that the current most honest assessment of Belarusian foreign policy is to say that it is in limbo, in the sense that after the events of the post-election crisis, uh, all the achievements the Belarusian MFA was working so hard in the previous years, they were just uh, uh, abruptly uh, cut and uh, put on stop. Uh, and uh, I would uh, just uh, reiterate that during um, 26 years of Lukashenko presidency, uh, the relations between uh, Belarus and the collective West, they were sort of in this eternal cycle of distancing, rapprochement, sanctions, uh, aiming to punish authoritarian leader uh, with uh, who conducted yet another like fertile intellections or uh, or caught uh, political prisoners, etc. And then there would be a um, a time of liberalization where Lukashenko would release those prisoners for some political uh, trade-offs uh, offered by the West for some uh, minor uh, sort of uh, concessions. And then uh, those uh, periods of distancing, they also led to a very close uh, ties with Russia where Belarus found itself uh, in uh, like deeply integrated in Eurasian led uh, structures and very um, highly dependent economically, politically on Russia. Uh, but uh, there was an uh, interesting time of normalization after Ukrainian events where Belarusian MFA uh, managed quite successfully to sell internationally the idea that Lukashenko is not perfect in terms of human rights uh, upkeeping, uh, but he is a reliable partner to deal with. And then just before this elections, uh, there were some sort of significant achievements in uh, relations with EU, where higher officials in Brussels were saying that we are at our highest point of uh, bilateral relations. And then with Washington, there were conversations about uh, establishing full-fledged, uh, re-establishing full-fledged diplomatic ties, and also some uh, conversations even to remove uh, the remaining sanctions, which were existing and restrictions, um, uh, which were existing under Belarus Democracy Act at that time, when uh, we knew that uh, Belarusian leadership um, hired lobbyists on the Hill to promote this idea. And uh, I'm not saying this could have happened, but uh, the, the general idea was that we are mo moving towards a much warmer uh, bilateral relations. And then everything uh, ended uh, very uh, abruptly uh, after the events uh, of August 9 and a few subsequent days where uh, what happened, uh, like this uh, unprecedented violence uh, past the uh, point of no return where there were actual deaths happening on the streets. And then uh, those unprecedented uh, cruelty uh, tortures, which were like documented and there were multiple evidences of that happening. And then there was no way for the international community other than to, uh, to, to realize like that there is the point of no return. And so where we are now after several months of the uh, post-election crisis in terms of like foreign policy options is that uh, the Belarusian leadership announced that we are sort of at the end of the multi-vector foreign policy. And of course uh, there are public condemnations on behalf of Lukashenko and ministry foreign affairs that the uh, sort of the evil West is uh, politicizing this uh, issue and that they're trying to interfere in domestic affairs uh, when they talk about their concerns with uh, human rights. But essentially, uh, there is very little uh, information um, on what the MFA is doing at the moment. Uh, and uh, there is no clear strategy they are pursuing. Uh, other than uh, trying to communicate with Russia, but even on this level, uh, there were just uh, a few meeting, a few meetings with, uh, uh, I think, like one meeting with Putin uh, over uh, past months, and then a recent meeting with uh, Lavrov. But then this is that much that the uh, current Belarusian leadership can get in terms of uh, some political, actual um, uh, political. Uh, contacts. And then this is happening at the very impressive um, uh, sort of background or comparison with what uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska is doing being based in Vilnius, what other uh, representatives of Belarusian democratic movement are doing being based in Warsaw, how much attention they uh, managed to bring internationally when uh, they managed to speak at places like uh, UN Security Council or meeting with uh, uh, Angela Merkel, uh, with uh, Macron, uh, with uh, 
uh, decision makers in Brussels who engage in conversations with Belarusian opposition leaders to get their perspectives on how uh, what could be the possible solution for the current uh, situation in Belarus. Um, and then uh, I would say like it is hard to um, to talk or like it's a bit like premature to talk about like what are the possible um, ways out of this uh, situation or we do not see much um, maybe outcomes of current um, talks and negotiations. I mean, when the Belarusian democratic forces are calling for OEC mediation or other more decisive actions on behalf of international community regarding Belarus, other than just introducing sanctions. Uh, but I would say that this situation is just uh, in its dynamics, it's a bit um, sort of early to, to talk about particular outcomes. Um, and also, I would touch on uh, Russia's interest in this um, uh, unfolding uh, crisis. Uh, and I would, uh, I think it's important to understand that although there is the level of rhetorical support coming from Moscow regarding the Union State with Belarus and sort of support for Lukashenko and no clear condemnation of what is happening in terms of human rights abuses on the ground. Uh, if we look at the facts, there were not so many uh, actual ways or steps on behalf of Kremlin to explicitly support Lukashenko. Uh, and it looks more like Kremlin is rather calculating their options to think what they can get out of current situation and what side to maybe support uh, in, in the longer run, including the idea maybe for supporting other political figures, for someone who is uh, uh, running on uh, sort of moderate political agenda, which is not anti-Russian, but it, this also could be a good time for Russia to uh, uh, to support another political leader other than the uh, Lukashenko, with whom there is no secret. Uh, Putin has little, uh, um, like they're not not friends, and they have like quite complicated relations over time. But at the same time, what we also know now, uh, and like this is no secret, this is sort of declared by uh, Belarusian democratic forces, they tried to reach out to Moscow, but Moscow remains silent, at least on the level of uh, sort of higher political contacts. But there are different attempts to try to reach out to Moscow uh, decision makers to explain that uh, the Belarusians are ready for some sort of dialogue and uh, with respect to Belarusian uh, like sovereignty, Belarusian interests, but uh, they are ready to explain to Moscow that maybe like it is time to withdraw support from Lukashenko and support other political forces. So far, those conversations did not, uh, like they were not fruitful, but again, this situation is uh, in uh, dynamics. Uh, and also there is another um, sort of uh, interesting, important political actor, which is China. And what was interesting is that uh, President Xi was uh, the first one to congratulate uh, Lukashenko on the elections. But then again, uh, if we look at the actual, uh, uh, actions of uh, China and uh, Chinese ambassador in Belarus, and then uh, the uh, scale of uh, like uh, Chinese projects in uh, Belarus during past uh, month, uh, it looked uh, as uh, China is also cautiously examining the, examining their options, trying not to explicitly support Lukashenko or to sort of uh, to to meddle in the situation to. Uh, express any kinds of political preferences because for China uh, Belarus is a place which is interested in uh, uh, primarily uh, economical sense as a place where there is the intersection of movement of goods from EU to uh, China and vice versa and then interesting for Chinese investments but they are not uh, really having those uh, direct like political interests uh, uh, in mind uh, and uh, um, when we talk about EU, obviously, like it, it has, there is a lot of like media coverage on what EU is uh, doing, at least like on the rhetorical support, on, on terms of uh, introducing sanctions and actively sort of involving in, in uh, how to support Belarusian uh, Belarusians uh, in Belarus. So there, there is quite a lot of information uh, sort of uh, in the in the media and at the level of uh, public statements. Um, there is also a lot of um, hope uh, when it comes to the US uh, role, which could uh, come into play after 
um, after uh, Biden uh, inauguration, but there is also some credit which uh, uh, should be given to the Trump administration. Uh, even uh, before the um, before the uh, elections, even at the time when there was this sort of um, uh, rapprochement, um, there, there were like signs of rapprochement between Washington and uh, authoritarian uh, leader Lukashenko, there were still some critical statements on behalf of State Department and uh, congressmen who uh, expressed their concerns about the situation with human rights in Belarus. And then there is also this uh, promising um, um uh act uh, like the Belarus democracy act which is now uh which has now passed um uh, the house and then we re really hope that it will be uh it will become a law by uh the end of the year that we won't uh, lose any any more time in terms of uh, seeing us being more uh active in supporting belarus because this uh, new text of the um uh, of the draft, it has lots of important provisions in terms of like urgent support to Belarusian civil society, also helping, to, uh, helping uh, Belarusians to um, overcome the internet blockage and providing technical assistance, but also uh, has this uh, important clause to support Belarusian sovereignty should other countries, well, mainly Russia, try to uh, sort of interfere to seize this opportunity with uh, weak uh, Belarusian uh, leadership. So um, I have just sort of the broadly uh, painted this uh, picture and, ha and uh, happy to talk in more details in Q&A session. But again, I want to reiterate that um, there is not much certainty about where this could go in terms of like what happens to Belarusian foreign policy because the MFA uh, and the Belarusian leadership has lost its credibility and uh, they have very little contact other than with uh, their traditional ally uh, in the East. And then uh, the rest of um, uh, sort of de facto diplomacy is happening from Vilnius and Warsaw, which makes the, the by the Belarusian democratic forces, which makes this uh, situation really uh, tricky. But uh, well, uh, let's hope for, for the uh, win of the democratic protest. Thank you all. That was just uh, phenomenal. You covered so much territory. Um, I, I want to get a start on, on the questions. And again, a reminder, you can send questions via the Q&A uh, chat function or um, on YouTube. They'll be relayed to us. And, and it's a little bit of a, um, of a historical and a comparative question. I, I recall in previous um, instances of protest and activity, especially during the so-called color revolutions, we wrote a lot in academia and analytical circles about diffusion, right? How one protest movement emulated the other, and there were variations on this, some successfully, some unsuccessfully, um, kind of modular effects as Mark Beisinger talked about them. And then eventually you also had authoritarian learning, how to counter protests based on this. What's so striking about this year is a kind of, it seems to me almost this compartmentalization between what's happening in Belarus, what's happening in Kyrgyzstan, what's happening, of course, in Nagorno-Karabakh. And so the question, and I, I have this particularly for, for Olga and, and Gerard, but the others can weigh in too, is, is this a function of this geopolitical framework, East versus West, having ripped apart so that everything doesn't seem structurally locked together? Or do we just have better methods like all your amazing survey data and you know technologies, and we can actually tell what's going on on the micro level. And the whole idea of diffusion was fictitious to begin with. I'm really curious how you're thinking about kind of Belarus and 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 what is actually impacting and 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 in this kind of ripple effect kind of paradigm that we're so used to thinking about political events in Eurasia. So I know it's not an easy conceptual question, but but I'm really curious, uh, Gerard and Olga, if you want to take a shot at this. Ola, do you want to go ahead? Because you're more focused on the uh, protest events themselves. I mean, I could say some general things, but uh, the event, the, uh, the protest event itself as a sort of a um, a, a site of learning and a site of diffusion of a, a adaptation of new repertoires and, and the like. And um, yeah, okay. I think I think actually 
Alexander might also have something to say about this. He's smiling because I, I have a feeling I know kind of what he's going to say. Um, I mean, in my book, I argue against uh, diffusion. So I'm maybe perhaps also a little predictable here. I think diffusion is important. I think it certainly was important. I love Mark's work. Mark is one of the most important mentors in my life. Um, but I think it was uh, overstated in many of the past cases, be it in Ukraine or elsewhere. Now, if we too think of into past protest events, be it the Jeans Revolution in Belarus or uh, other events, um, sure, they were connected to a variety of international training networks. Those are ongoing, those haven't stopped, right? Uh, but to tie all activism to these internationally funded training networks, exercises, conferences, or even grants, as we know, it, there's, there's a weak causality there, right? And I think Josh's work about um, individual calculi that protesters go through and the var variety of triggers that may or may not be important. Um, mm -hmm. I think Josh's work specifically on the electoral trigger back a few years back was really important to understanding this. So I, I think some of that stuff was already um, uh, discussed. So I think what I want to say here is diffusion can still happen, but it certainly uh, I don't think has ever happened in the way some of the early diffusion hypotheses would have said. Um, and here I think I would really just give a hello to Alexander because the past matters. There is a history of activism, even if there isn't a history of this, this extent of mass mobilization, there is a history of activist networks. There are activist leaders, and this is not happening out of nowhere in Belarus. Yeah. Um, so that's just what I have to say. Perfect. Alexander, do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah. Well, I just to continue on Olga's thought. Absolutely. It was what happened perhaps is that, uh, this 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 protest movement uh, it emerged from long tradition of protest in Belarus. If you look at the history of protest, in fact, there were many or several attempts to imitate or at least repeat what's been happening in Ukraine. First of all, because Ukraine is the nearest, and well, it wasn't that uh, not not comparable at all what we see now. But what happened three years ago was very uh, kind of um, authentic mobilization happened around economic cause that grew into political cause very fast. And, and that's where the core of the current most important leaders of the protest emerged and settled around activism. So they became professional activists, many of them. Most of them now are in prison and we don't hear much from them because they were preventively isolated even before election day when the mass mobilization happened. But those people played a crucial role and they joined the movement not uh, one month, three months ago. They didn't join it because they learned about Ukraine. They joined it because of their grievances three years ago. And since then, that's how this process was boiling and now I think erupted. That's, that's what I think would be one of the most interesting historical parallel. Fascinating, thanks. Josh or Gerard, did you want to weigh in on this too? Or? Yeah, I, let me just um, try to address it from the perspective of a um, geopolitical narrative. I mean, another way of talking about diffusion is to talk about dominoes. Uh, and it, so we're getting into the realm of sort of conspiracy and paranoia on the part of uh, certain leaders, great powers who see uh, that there's quote unquote, no accident that colored revolutions are happening. Um, and, and what I think is quite interesting in the current moment is, is two things. One is Lukashenko has hit that discourse very hard. So it's colored revolutions that are being plotted by the West. So that rhetoric is still to the fore. It's still part of his repertoire uh, and it has been affirmed by Putin. Um, to a lesser extent, it hasn't been amplified. They haven't bought into uh, the full extent, but it had, I mean, he, Putin, they met, Putin did hand him $1.5 billion in effect. So that is a pretty big endorsement of that particular rhetoric. Um, so, so that's point, one, point number one. Point number two is that it was often felt that one could not have regime change within post-Soviet space. But with the Velvet Revolution, you saw 
uh, tactics on the part of protesters which were uh, actively de-geopoliticizing. In other words, they were learning from Maidan, pulling out the NATO flags, pulling out the EU flags, very careful about what they were protesting was against the uh, kleptocracy within Armenia and they were not protesting against Russia. What is interesting about Belarus, and I don't know the answer to this, is that it seems as if this is happening also. Now, the degree to which that is a deliberate geo, deo, de geopoliticizing strategy on the part of the protesters who actually may be more pro-West or maybe inclined towards the EU, um, the degree to which they're doing that deliberately or not, uh, because it's simply, it's very clear to them, it's simply about the, uh, the kleptocracy and the authoritarian uh, dictatorship that they've had to live under for decades now. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that and, and whether there has been that learning or not, but that's the, the, a question that I would, would pose and I'm kind of very interested in it. I really like that idea of the politics of the geopoliticization. Let's bear that in mind for a future session. Uh, Josh. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I wanna ask uh, Elise Giuliano's question, which is sort of builds off of this one nicely, which is sort of to say, you know, maybe put in dialogue Ola with Katarina and uh, Katarina, Katarina and, uh, and Gerard about this question of Ola, the attitudes you found of these sort of pro-Western attitudes among the protesters that sort of contra a bit of the media narrative that we've gotten that has been invoked to explain why Russia is sort of less upset about what is going on in Belarus than Russia was what was going on in Ukraine, which is not, it's not actually a pro-Western anti-Russian movement. So there seems to be, and Gerard, maybe you wanna weigh in from what you had found beforehand, but there seems to be some tension here between the survey data that you found, Ola, suggesting, and maybe it's more more than it was more, you know, I was trying to keep track of everything you were showing us so quickly. Maybe it's more about the younger protesters holding these attitudes. Um, but are we missing something here? Is there a piece of the story? Like which one of these things is more off? Is Russia not getting the fact that it is actually a pro-Western movement in the way that the Ukrainian, you know, Euromaidan had a pro-West element to it? Or, and, and maybe as uh, Katarina said, it's willfully ignoring this fact because they see it as an opportunity to finally get rid of Lukashenko, which is problematic for other reasons. Or do you think that it, this is overstated and this sort of media narrative is correct, that this actually really doesn't have a, a Western dimension to it? So I pose that to all three of you, to whoever wants to answer. I don't know, uh, uh, Katarina, if you wanna go first. Yeah, uh, so first, uh, if we, talk about the motivation of the protesters. Um, in the first days, it was about who got how much percent of votes uh, on the uh, vote day, right? And then people were frustrated with Lukashenko's decision to run for, 20, uh, for a sixth term in a row and uh, with uh, the um, sort of the, the cruelty and unfairness of the even the presidential uh, electoral campaign, how the front runners were banned from uh, being registered as candidates, and when how the repressions were uh, um, happening even towards those who were active during the presidential race. And then there was this COVID factor uh, also adding on this uh, protest mood when people realized that the system is sort of dysfunctional and then the uh, government uh, covers up the actual statistics on COVID. Uh, so that was like the, the overall discontent with the authorities uh, during the first days of the protest. Uh, but over time, when authorities responded with lots of uh, disproportionate violence, and when they saw how many, like, uh, this is unprecedented for Belarus, when there were several deaths related to the protest uh, against the happening uh, by, by uh, like, people were literally, like, beaten to death by police with all cruelty, those who reported tortures, though, those who uh, tried to file complaints against the policemen, they were uh, having uh, additional prosecution and sort of punished once again for uh, daring to speak up. And then uh, after those continuous weeks and essentially months of the protest, uh, the motivation is uh, uh, changing uh, from the idea of, again, people are not thinking that today or do not remember actually like who got how much uh, votes um, 
-hmm. by electoral assigned by electoral commissions, but it's more of conversation about speaking up against uh, cruelty and people realizing that the legal system is not uh, functioning and that they uh, live in fear and that uh, uh, like over those days, there were over 31,000 uh, people detained and not and multiple like few thousands, four thousand. Um, uh, okay, so like multiple uh, cases of uh, tortures. And then in this case, uh, it's more of a protest. It's hard to be a bystander, even if you were previously apolitical. And then uh, here we don't have much conversation in, in people's uh, sort of consciousness about political choices or like geopolitical thinking. It's more about uh, just uh, going on the street, knowing that you and your relatives uh, will be uh, safe. Ola, do you wanna jump in? Oh, sorry. I just, I apologize. I, I just realized I was unmuted the whole time. I hope I didn't uh, no, write fine. anything. Yeah, totally fine. I just wanna here come back to actually the difference between, and not to highlight Josh's past work again and again, the difference between triggers and then other policy preferences that that protesters may also hold, right? So I don't think, Gerard, this is a de-geopolitization. I think the trigger is different from what it was in Ukraine in 2013-14. And that's very important, right? Um, at least the initial trigger, right? The election. So when we break it down in what in terms of what triggers do, right? The, tr the first trigger was the election and it can motivate and it can mobilize. It certainly motivated a lot of people, but it mobilized a smaller portion of committed activists. Then the next trigger is you have mass repression that is wholesale, not targeting any particular groups, just putting thousands of people into the same cells. And you have a cross cleavage re repression on mass, right? And that actually creates this channel of information network thing happening. More and more of society hears about the repression, more and more of society is triggered and motivated to join in and more are also mobilized, right? And then you have simultaneously this phenomenon that amongst the protesters, they seem to have certain, some seem to have certain types of geopolitical preferences. But please note to what I said, I never said that the majority of protesters in, have a preference for joining the EU, only 43% of protesters. So still, although a large number, a minority of eating protesters. And when compared to non-protesters, which only 25% want to join the EU, you see that there is a differentiation in the rate. But this doesn't mean that protesters support more joining, I mean, they support more comparatively, but that they are not, uh, you know, 50% plus of protesters do not want to join the EU and so on and so forth. So I think those two things can be equally true. The protest doesn't have to be about geopolitics for protesters to have certain policy preferences. Gerard, do you want to respond or should we move on? Sure. Um, just briefly, uh, I see the situation as um, very difficult for Russia and the Putin administration. I think they're dealing with a, a malign uh, stability. What was a stability is now an instability within Belarus. And they have a really tricky task, which is to remove the current uh, regime and uh, the sort of oppressive structures of power uh, that uh, are keeping, that they are funding in part, uh, to, that are keeping him in power. And they have to move it to a, a condition where they can have a, a leader that is a, going to represent a new normal for Belarus. I think the protesters are pro-Belarus, uh, first and foremost. And Belarus doesn't see itself as a client state of Russia. It sees itself as an in-between state. Uh, if you ask people about it, give them a choice, and you don't make it binary, but you say neutral as a, a third option, most people will choose neutral. So um, Russia has um, effectively to manage a transition here uh, because they cannot continue to have the current geopolitical order. Otherwise, they risk radicalizing uh, protesters in the population. And that's what I meant by inevitable geopoliticization, is that uh, after a while, people will realize that this is something that uh, is being imposed upon them uh, and sustained 
uh, by the key relationship and the key funds that are coming from from Russia. And I, and I think there's plenty of evidence that you know Russia did not want uh, Lukashenko to uh, to remain in power and wanted to engineer a transition. And I, I think that's the most likely option uh, that we're going to see going forward. That's great. Um, I want to bundle a couple of questions on the topic of um, liberalism and the protesters. Uh, one from Anton uh, Sabolev, who says, uh, do you have any preliminary explanation of the fact that the protesters look less pro-liberal than the non-protesters in your sample? And combine that with Peter Rutland's question um, about uh, the findings from all of that protesters are less liberal than non-protesters on gender and uh, 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 gay issues. That may be part of an international pattern of angry men taking to social media from US to Korea. So interesting and in probing some of these uh, uh, sources of these values here. Olaf? Just also trying to read the questions here on the screen to make sure I got them. Uh, Peter, I'll take your question first. Uh, we, I, I didn't actually, before this talk, I didn't take a look at the gender breakdown of, of that question, which is an obvious thing I'd have to control for if I did anything more, more important here. So um, uh, that, that, that would still mean, uh, I, based on what we know in terms of the protesters are 55%, I would still be surprised if, if that would be such a dramatic difference. Um, but yeah, we can certainly do that and I can get back to you on that specifically. Um, I have no, I have no actually answer uh, for to Anton in terms of why is this a fact. I, we have to do more analyses of our data. Um, there's various, uh, statistical tools I can use to analyze generally uh, my data. I can also look at, you know, other trends on Facebook simultaneously to us running this survey and other trends on Twitter to us running the survey. Under so there's a variety of things we still need to do in terms of cleaning up this data to be certain what we are capturing and when and how. And obviously, any proper reporting of this, we would need to do some kind of statistical analysis to control for a variety of variables, right? Um, but I just think, I, I don't know, I had this hunch that uh, the general population, even amongst the protesters, isn't actually as liberal on these things as we would think. Um, and that actually strikes me in the visual imagery of the protest, right? Feminine beauty, flowers are very central to some of the protesting. And that doesn't always, in my, at least in my view, as a Ukrainian uh, feminist that obviously grew up in some part in, in, in uh, North America, that doesn't jive with me about necessarily having very progressive gender role views. But I don't, I don't know, we'll see. I mean, I think there's much more to be determined than to just make a decision uh, about the protesters so far. Could I uh, jump in with just uh, some statistics from our um, survey, which is that the um, breakdown we have on that question, sh husband should make important decisions. Those that agree, 34.5%, neither agree nor disagree, 35%, and those that disagree, 28.8%. Uh, so, fairly even uh, in terms of the attitudes overall um, within the population as a whole in this particular sample. Great, uh, thanks so much. I, I wanna bundle a couple of questions, one from uh, Anton Sobolev, one that I had uh, for Alexander about on the internet dimension of here. So one question is, um, uh, Anton uh, mentions that uh, during the wave, this wave of protests, activists were very creative in using IT technologies. So face recognition of policemen, DDoS attacks against state web servers against the current government. Um, do you think they had any effect? And what do you think would be a good, how would we know if they had any effect? And the question I wanted to ask you, which I'll bundle these two together because it's a different question, but it's also internet related, is about the organizational movement on Telegram. And so you teased us in the beginning by sort of saying, 
you know, the, the word on these internet organized protests is that they are these, you get these leaderless protests because it's so much easier for people to get organized. You don't need the longstanding organization, et cetera. We, could, we all know this argument. Um, but my question is, so you sort of teased us with this idea that no, these actually were internet protests, but that they had a bit of this leadership structure. And you gave us some ideas about the leadership structure, but then you went into this, this description of these groups on Telegram that did very much look like a kind of super decentralized movement different from our sort of Twitter revolutions that we've talked about before, which are these all these sort of one to many and many to many, these are sort of many, you know, few to few, which is a different measure. But I couldn't help but struck by, be struck by when you're discussing the organization on Telegram with these very small localized networks that were very hard to get into, that you tried to sort of vouch for yourself or people had to vouch for yourself, vouch for you to get into them, how much this sounded all, all like old cells in revolutionary movements, right? That you would have these cells and they would be hard to get into and you had to vouch for someone and then the state would try to infiltrate them and it had this very familiar ring to it. However, then this is where my question goes. With the revolutionary cells, you think about these small cells that where you can't betray more people, but you do think of them about being embedded in a larger hierarchy. So the cell is getting its order from someone higher up. And maybe that's done in a way so that the, they can't betray them to the secret police, but the lower level cells have this connection going up and then maybe it goes up another level or two. And so my question is, is that being reflected in Telegram? So when you show us these maps with 428 of these local discussion groups on Telegram, is there a secondary level where representatives of these apartment buildings are getting together with each other in another super secret Telegram group that you have to be vouched for to sort of play a higher level coordination? Or is there something about the affordances of Telegram, this combination of Twitter and YouTube and these different features with these embedded kind of WhatsApp super secret messaging apps that means the platform can fulfill this role. And so I can be a local group only really talking with these 18 people I trust, but I can still figure out what the other local groups are doing because people are posting anonymously and there's enough coordination that I don't need that secondary level of organization that we had in the revolutionary networks. So I'll pass those over to you, Alexander. Yeah, that's a great question. Um... Thank you. Thank you a lot for, for thinking of, of, of it. And this definitely provides a way forward to think about the protest. Just briefly on IT question, I would say, uh, yes, people were creative. And yes, they did well in emerge, imagining new tools uh, to address the challenges they faced. One of the challenges was um, how to oppose the repressive practices of the police. And they noticed police were masked mostly. So they tried to anonymize them. Though I wouldn't say this specific technique were very successful because they claim they use AI to reveal the face of a person hidden by mask. I'm not sure that any AI so far is av available and able to do this type of operation. Though there was other innovation that were not so far featured that promptly, but I think this innovation was a key one for the first, very first days of mass mobilization in August. And this innovation was a platform, in fact, an integration of a number of platforms, including Telegram, for election observation. In fact, Belarusian protest movement solved a long standing problem of many. Uh, election observers in authoritarian states of how to reveal the fraud. So it's, it's a long perhaps story, but uh, just making it very short, it feels like they solved it quite successfully by connecting first numbers of people who joined observation with their uh, center of processing information from election polling station and masses who very quickly learned about uh, fraud, something uh, that previously in Belarus and many other countries was very difficult to combine these three important components of election observation. They were very successful in that. And again, Telegram played quite important role because it helped to connect both observers who would send their data to the center through Telegram and then to people who would learn results from their local police station by interacting with a bot uh, on Telegram, uh, like a little program that helps you to sort of 
like an, an, an NII sort of uh, technique in, in Telegram. Coming back to the question of um, uh, organizing and, uh, uh, and centralization within the movement, it some something you, you, you just ask, I really have no idea. And I really sometimes, some of the answers, uh, answers to the question you ask, I really don't know. And I don't want to really know <laughs> because it, no, this knowledge at the moment might be <laughs> something uh, that, uh, yeah, well, uh, no, no, it might be actually dangerous to know this stuff. What I think uh, is uh, what's happening is quite general decentralization. And uh, I don't feel, and but I have no proof of that, but I don't feel there is any, we might learn later. But at the moment, it doesn't feel to me that there is much centralization between local cells uh, beyond, say, an area. So I would say there, there might be some centralization around a district, for instance, in a town or within a town if it's a small town. Or another way to, to exchange, exchange actually around professional uh, network. There's something I didn't mention. Another type of uh, organizing is around profession. So people who work together, they often organize in cells and then also organize collective action, such as doctors, very prominent strata in this movement, such as IT specialists, such as uh, culture, culture workers, uh, culture creative people, and so on and so forth. They get organized based on profession. And that's how maybe exchange also happens. So indeed, there, there is some element of connective action, but uh, at the same time, there is very prominent presence of leadership uh, on different levels that might not be interacting between each other, but this is something we really need to investigate. And indeed, this movement looks more and more like a rebellion, a revolutionary rebellion that acts more on, uh, well, some people, and actually people like calling themselves um, rebels or uh, guerrillas. So they, they kind of revoking, the, some people call it collective memory. Some people would call it some kind of uh, actually ideological, ideologized education. Uh, uh, Belarus uh, had a very strong tradition of this type of forest rebellion that existed during the Second World War. I don't know, but it feels like that there is something happening around this um, kind of very secret uh, uh, organizing that we don't know at the moment everything about, and perhaps we will learn with time. But I think affordances in it is indeed something that really helped people in that regard. Thank you, Oxer. We are almost out of time. So I'm gonna ask one more because this is the RPP and I'm gonna ask Katya to answer it in no more than 30 seconds and anyone else who wants to weigh in on it in no more than 30 seconds. And that's from Tracy Rue. From the Russian perspective, do you see Moscow's reaction so far with Belarus a result of their lessons learned from Ukraine 2014. We've been talking about lessons learned from the home country, but do we have any insights on what the Kremlin has learned? I'm not sure that this is about Kremlin position itself. I think it's more about the uh, agenda with uh, the Belarusian Democratic Forces. Uh, from, they're trying to promote a very neutral rhetoric and more friendly rhetoric towards Russia trying not to trigger sort of the Russian bear, understanding that we are unprotected against any potential aggression if it happens. And then we need to use any uh, diplomatic, uh, nice conversations to accommodate Russia's interests. Great, thank you. Uh, Gerard, do you wanna weigh in on that? Um, I think it's a great question. I don't have you know empirical data, I'd love to find out. And I would say that there's evidence both for and against. Uh, it is surprising to me the degree to which the uh, Putin administration supported Lukashenko when it was evident that uh, there was a major breach in legitimacy crisis. So that would not indicate that there's uh, learning, but then the evidence for it is that, let's see what happens over the next six months. Uh, and in terms of what's happening uh, behind the scenes and forcing Lukashenko to meet with the opposition leaders in jail and then forcing him to, you know, have this uh, rhetoric of a constitutional change, which is a, a way of face saving exit for him. Perfect. Thank you. Um, well, we are at time. So thank you, Gerard. Thank you, Ola. Thank you, Katya. Thank you, Alexander. Thanks to everyone who tuned in to watch us. Thank you also to Carly, 
um, to Sasha. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to putting these on. Always grateful. And as always, uh, to my partner, Josh, on this. And just a reminder that our first session of next year um, will take place in January, on January 13th at noon. And we will be uh, talking about uh, the state of AIDS research um, in Russia uh, and AIDS and public health. So drawing an interesting historical analogy there. Until then, have a good rest of semester. Happy holidays to everyone. Um, be safe. And thanks again. Um, see you all very soon.